Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us today. On behalf of everyone at Perficient and Salesforce, welcome to today's webinar, Accelerating Partner Management, How Manufacturers Can Navigate COVID-19. My name is Jen Thompson, and I lead Salesforce marketing here at Perficient. It's truly a pleasure to welcome you all this morning. Because this is no exaggeration, we have the absolute best in the business speaking here today. You guys both know the manufacturing industry inside and out, so it is really an honor to introduce our featured speakers today. Uh, Tony Cradiville, as many of you know, he is the Vice President of Manufacturing, Go-To-Market Salesforce Industries. Tony has been a trailblazer and expert in the industry for more than 20 years, and he is a true visionary in driving change in manufacturing and automotive. Thanks for being here today, Tony. I'm also very excited to introduce Eric Ducart, our National Sales Executive at Proficient. Eric has also been a leader in the manufacturing space for about two decades, working with manufacturers like Bobcat, Ecolab, MTD, and many, many more. I'm sure some of you know him from his days at Sundog, which is now part of Proficient, bringing all of that deep manufacturing expertise to a bigger worldwide stage. Welcome, Eric. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks. Again, thank you. <laughs> thank you both for joining us. We're going to keep this pretty informal and conversational today, kind of like a fireside chat, even though it's about 90 degrees outside for some of us. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and get started. And Eric, I'll start with you. You work with so many different manufacturers, automotive, discrete, process, you name it, and you've been in this industry for a long time. Can you start by telling us about a few of the top trends and challenges for manufacturers over the last couple of years? You bet. Well, you're making me feel bad. I keep saying multiple decades, 20 plus years, <laughs> making me feel old. Um, Sorry. You know, I, I, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's a, it's actually kind of a difficult question, you know, to answer right now. And I think the title, you know, of our slide here is pretty accurate in terms of this complex market um, that manufacturers are in when you think about this as kind of pre and post COVID. Um, and when Tony and I were, were kind of putting this together, we really want in this session to talk about that and really think about how the industry is being affected um, before COVID and now um, as part of COVID. But I think what we're seeing is that these underlying challenges that manufacturers are trying to solve have always been there. Uh, the biggest thing that's happening now is COVID has just accelerated everything. Um, you're seeing how quickly, look look how quickly it, dealers are are setting up drop-off services, um, firing up online ordering. Um, these are all things that were taking years and years before uh, for them to, to move forward, and all this is now being stood up in a matter of months. It's not perfect, uh, but many of them are doing it. So... When you look at this list, I think there's some underlying challenges that manufacturers are, are, are wrestling with. Um, one of those is how do they create more revenue streams? How do they create a service-based business model by looking to really digitize their operating model, uh, their customer experience, how they engage with their partners? Uh, another one that um, Tony will touch on a little bit more is, is the skilled workforce. Um, and, and how do we leverage technology now to be able to collect information, collaborate more effectively um, with our workforce? And last is new revenue streams. Um, manufacturers have, over the last few years have invested significantly in IoT-enabled products, and many are looking to now capitalize on that investment and create new revenue streams that sit outside uh, the traditional product innovation um, model that they've had. So again, these are all industry challenges that many of you are facing and know about. Um, they've all been there uh, before COVID and now really you know, our, our lens on this is that it's really being accelerated um, to move faster to be able to, to solve for these. And we've worked in you know, the manufacturing space for many years, uh, leveraging Salesforce to solve these types of challenges. Uh, recently, we commissioned Forrester Research to do a study for us to look at what is the total economic impact to our customers in, in the work that we're doing. 
Forrester's overall point of view is that companies, they need to become more customer obsessed. Um, whether we use the term customer obsessed or customer centric, um, but we've got to use and put the customer at the center of what we do. And that really becomes a competitive advantage to any company that's focusing their business strategy, operating models, um, budgets, that's really working towards enhancing the knowledge of and engaging with their customers. What we wanted to do is ask Forrester to take that analysis one step further and look at it and how, how can we include uh, the partner ecosystem in, into that. And um, what they did is they surveyed proficient customers where we implemented Salesforce and to help accelerate their partner management. Uh, and the study found that manufacturers obtained 114% ROI, uh, almost $4 million in benefit within the first three years. Uh, also, we've increased marketing budget efficiencies. Uh, marketers are able to keep that same budget that they've had, but extend it, do more with it. Uh, we've increased the quality of leads that are getting to their partner. That's bringing that relationship between the manufacturer and their partners together more effectively. And we've reduced internal development costs by leveraging a Salesforce platform and really using that cloud-based technology, um, we can drive down in internal development costs uh, as part of it. But the one that you know today I really want to highlight um, in today's climate is is the payback. Um, on many of the payback costs on many of these projects is less than three months. Um, that gets you solutions that can get you up and running faster, uh, which we all know is very important today. It's a great study. Um, we've got lots of insights, uh, business case metrics that are in it, and uh, we'll share more at the end of the webinar on how to access uh, that report for all of you. But you know, while we know um, most progressive manufacturers in the industry are trying to solve for these challenges, um, each are approaching it differently based on their business model. And when you throw in a pandemic in the middle of this, you have really all kinds of craziness that you're, you're trying to sort through um, as a leader. So we're gonna share our point of view on COVID. Uh, we'll share some real world examples of manufacturers tackling these challenges. And one of the, some of the common issues for manufacturers today is, and at the top of that list is forecasting. Um, if you look at dealerships and shops and suppliers, these are all working remote and only some are starting to open back up. This has been a huge disruption to forecasting, um, knowledge and knowing where you are, not only from a, a sales forecasting perspective, but also your manufacturing plans. Um, all the way downstream to supply chain. Um, we've all been in in our our stores. We've all been in in home goods stores, and and we're seeing the lack of product on shelves. So we see that distribute the the disruption to supply chain and distribution is now really impacting everybody, um, and it's bringing to life how important connecting our supply chain to our manufacturer to our distributors is. Um, it's all being visible right in front of us today. But I, I think everybody would agree, I assume everybody would agree that this pandemic is going to change the way that we buy. Um, it's gonna change the way that we interact with others. Um, it really is accelerating the need for manufacturers to digitize their customer and their partner experience and their operating model, which is what we wanna talk about uh, today. How can we help support you do that through that? And, Digital transformation is such a, a broad term. Um, we all know there's many different ways to look at digital transformation. So we thought uh, an easy way to share a strategy is to put it in context to how other manufacturers are doing it. A leading welding manufacturing company needed to change the way that they collaborated with their distributors. Um, this client has a very complex distribution network, uh, which inherently comes with many different types of partner relationship challenges that they're facing. One of those key challenges was their warranty system and really the inefficiency that they had with their warranty claim process. Uh, it was costing them time, it was costing them money, but most importantly, um, what we are hearing is, is was impacting the overall experience to their distributors and to their distributors and customers. To start, we had to move them off of a kind of homegrown legacy portal 
um, and move them to more of a collaborative partner community, a, a way that they could have their distributors collaborate uh, real time with them. And what it afforded them was a single platform that brought together their customer data, their product information, and the associated distributors. We made those connections, we connected that information by building it around the business process that they were challenged with, which was the warranty process. Um, through this whole project, what they've really gotten out of it is much better visibility into warranty metrics. Um, we've allowed them for more increased efficiencies and, and faster product replacement to those end customers. It, it, through the portal, they now have access to engineering reports for those defective products. So they can take corrective action much faster than they could before, uh, saving time and money. But last and, and probably most important is they really in, uh, improve the experience of their end customers and their distributors. But all you guys know, when you have independent partners, whether that's a dealer, a distributor, or a reseller, it's important that when you're asking them to share information and engage with you, that you provide the tools that make it more efficient and personalized for their needs. And that, that to me, is the difference between um, legacy portals where it's one-way communication, you're pushing uh, service bulletins, you're pushing out product specs, you're pushing things out to a portal, and really transforming the way that you engage uh, with your partners through a community. And, and we leverage uh, Salesforce Community Cloud for that. And here in their community, what you'll see is that we've made it very simple for them to be able to register product. Um, all of you know that data around your product is typically locked up in your backend systems like your ERP. But when you unlock that product information in CRM and you allow partners to be able to help connect product to your customer data, it really enables so many downstream processes related to marketing, sales, service, and operations. So that's, that's the key, is connecting that information together. And one of those things we did was give them a serial number lookup. Um, it, what we did is we put it in context to their customer's data so they can quickly search products um, all the way down to a serial number um, in some of these more complex configurations. We also enabled a community discussion. You know, this was something very new for them where, where they were able to uh, be able to allow their distributors to access, imp access their product managers, their service lead, their territory managers. So when they had questions, whether they were in the field on a mobile device or in front of their computer, they could pose questions to service leads and start working on um, some of these service uh, requests uh, very quickly. So this is the foundation. When you think about partner management, the foundation is building and managing your partner ecosystem from onboarding new partners to servicing them uh, through the community. But now that we've connected that, that customer product information with Salesforce and we've exposed it through Community Cloud to the distributors, we can de deliver value through lookups. Um, partners can quickly look up uh, products by serial number, uh, product descriptions, and they can start that troubleshooting process. Uh, we give them the service history of that product. Uh, from manufacturing perspective, if you think about kind of the service history from a manufacturer's perspective, they now have visibility across their entire network. Um, Products that get resold or they're transferred between partners, it's now visible. All of that's visible to the manufacturer. But through the access controls within Salesforce, we can configure it so only distributors see their customers, their products, and warranty information. So visibility for the manufacturer, the right visibility for uh, right visibility for each of those distributors. Last, I'm going to talk about. Uh, if everyone else could go on mute. That would be great. Um, the last here, what I talk about is is really the warranty claim process. At the top of the screen, you can see how we now are showing product price and partner information. Um, looks very simple on the screen, but as all of you know, that is really difficult to do when you've got independent dealers and distributors. Um, and we've enabled 
those distributors because we've given them value, right? We, we're allowing them to easily work with their service group uh, to determine if something's under warranty. If it is, they can quickly submit a claim and track that, that warranty claim all the way back to the end customer. So in this, uh, some key takeaways that, that I hope you guys are seeing. One, when you look to engage your partners, consider a business process that's either broken that you need to fix or is a key process how you engage with your partners. If you wrap a strategy or a project around that, your success in getting uh, your distributor engagement or your dealer engagement is going to go up significantly. Um, the foundation is building that collaborative community and you want to streamline a process to make it easier for them to work with you. And when you do that, you'll get, you'll get your dealers or your distributors to be able to share information back with you. All right. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to Tony, uh, Tony Cradiville. I've worked with Tony for a number of years. And as Jen said, um, he really is one of the innovators in the industry. So I'm very excited to have him share his perspective on what's happening in the industry and also how Salesforce uh, as a company solving, you know, many of these challenges that we've got going right now. So Tony, I will turn it over to you. All right. And uh, thank you, Eric. And thank you to the proficient team. Yeah, I've known Eric for a number of years now, and uh, what's always been great about Eric and, and uh, you know, his the team delivery approach is they've been our go-to partner in many respects for types of solutions in manufacturing where a dealer or distribution um, uh, uh, community is involved. Um, you know, with Dreamforce, all the events we do, it, it's uh, Eric always delivers, so it's uh, great to be able to support the discussion today. Uh, the, the team asked me to give a bit of a overview on where we're headed with the manufacturing capabilities within Salesforce here. And uh, for those that are part of the Salesforce community already, you've probably heard of manufacturing cloud. So I am going to spend a few minutes on that and uh, and really give give an overview of how we're thinking about manufacturing, some of the needs, I think some of the gaps also that have been in uh, traditional CRM deployments and CRM software. And where we're taking that in terms of extending it out to to the uh, broader um, distribution community inside the manufacturing ecosystem. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. And before we do, um, it, we are a publicly traded company, Salesforce, and we are going to be talking about uh, some new functionality that we're putting in place. So just want to encourage everyone on the phone to uh, make any buying decisions on software on the basis of commercially available software. And with that, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what uh, we're hearing from manufacturing customers. And for us, uh, manufacturing as a community is one of the, the largest within Salesforce. Uh, financial services is a little bit bigger in terms of scope and scale. Uh, but in terms of uh, diversity of use cases, in terms of, um, of uh, what I'd say innovative solution, I'd argue that uh, manufacturing customers in many ways lead the pack here. Um, as a CRM solution, we've, we've been working with manufacturing customers for over uh, 20 years. Uh, those solutions kind of range from, you know, fairly simple Salesforce automation type uh, solutions all the way through to giant, you know, digital transformation initiatives where companies are really looking at uh, transforming their entire approach to the market, how they work with channel partners, how they work with end customers. So, um, that's that's one thing. Having been at Salesforce for five years, that I, I've um, it's been kind of nice to see the solutions themselves are scalable. Um, as you're looking to think about projects and deployment, you know you can start small, but also have a broader transformation vision in mind. Uh, some common themes, though, that are pretty consistent about this uh, uh, commu community, manufacturing community specifically. I think most manufacturers today are are pivoting around the customer. I mean, if you think about the evolution of manufacturing capabilities, it's really traditionally been all about the product. And it's about getting a product to market at the lowest possible cost, with the highest possible quality, and doing it efficiency, right? All our metrics are around efficiency, but more and more, it's pivoting the company around customer needs. And I think the big driver of that is it's getting more and more difficult to differentiate on the basis of product alone. There's so much transparency in the marketplace, uh, spec, speeds, feeds, availability, all that is so readily available to our customers and our distribution partners. 
if for us to di differentiate on the product, it's really tough. And so, you know, what other tools can we put in place? What other types of technologies, software, services, support options can we, we have that really differentiate the overall business um, and enhance the value of the product? I think an, another major trend here is really bringing your ecosystem into the fold. And if, if you think about how most manufacturers, and I'd say it's probably 60, 70% of manufacturers go to market through some type of distribution channel. In some ways, your distribution channel is the face of your company. And the true you know, sales process to end customers, the service, the support process is often through our distribution partners. With that in mind, and, and with the idea of differentiate your business on the basis of some of these non-product attributes, it, it's super important to, to pull your distribution partners into that mix. And in fact, to the end customer, make it appear as if your distribution partner is really no different than, than your, the manufacturing company, right? We're, we're operating in lockstep along the way. And I think the, the final piece, and what was interesting here as a community, as a manufacturing community, it was probably one of the top asks of us at Salesforce was how do we get demand into the system? Uh, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, a lot of this is the CRM roots. Most CRM systems operate in the world of sales process, Salesforce automation, collaboration. So some of the, these software attributes around um, getting contracts in place, you know, collaborating with that, with the customer. The reality is this idea of, forecasting for a manufacturer wasn't always part of, of, um, of, the, of the traditional CRM solution. And, you know, as a, as a community, that was one of the top asks uh, back to Salesforce was we want to get better insight into demand, make sure that, um, you know, we, we can connect the dots, right, between our, our distribution partners, their demand, and customers, their demand, and then ultimately what we have to produce as a company. And, you um, this really became uh, the idea behind Manufacturing Cloud. We had a solid CRM foundation in place around marketing, sales, service functionality, but we wanted to, to really pull that, that sales, the S of the SNLP, if you will, into the CRM solution. And that idea behind that was to, to have a common pane of glass for everything around customer interactions, sales process, pricing negotiations, and then ultimately the execution of, of that uh, price negotiation, that contract that's in place. And that, um, that became the foundation for what we're calling manufacturing cloud. Uh, partners, as is, is we've been talking about um, all morning here, are really a key to making that work. Um, you know, again, 60, 70 percent of manufacturers go to market through some type of partner network. And, um, you know, demand and insight into their planned usage, consumption, uh, orders uh, of product is, is critically important here. And so that became, uh, you know, an extension or a thought to, that, that went into this as well. And then lastly, because we now have visibility into that, that the demand patterns, the demand structured, it, it really opened up our ability to, to build some insightful analytics around um, uh, some, some capabilities that we haven't traditionally seen in either the CRM or the ERP markets. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes here, what that, uh, what that means. Um, the other major theme that we see, if you go to the next slide, Eric, is that the account team, the role of the account team isn't just customer facing. And I think the best way to describe it from a, a manufacturing perspective is that account team is really the quarterback. The, the quarterback of the cadence between all the interactions at a customer, um, the, the issues, the, the the quality events, the the late deliveries, um, and then of course the sales aspects. You know, getting contracts in place, pricing agreements, negotiating on volumes, um, all that unstructured data is a, is a key part of their job. But they are also the conduit back to that operations team. And operations, you know, meaning manufacturing meaning finance, um, all the folks that at the end of the day kind of live in this ERP world. Um, in some cases, some of this stuff is fairly siloed, but they all have customer uh, connection points, right? And more often than not, account teams become the, the human middleware in order to making these connections in place. For us, we really want to focus on this 
overall macro problem with manufacturing cloud. It really put the tools in the hands of the account teams for managing both sides of the equation here, but also visibility in place for both customers and partners as well as operations teams. So they have a common dial tone into that, that uh, customer uh, information. So what does that really drive? And if you think about the traditional CRM use cases in trying to measure value against them, sometimes that's pretty tough. You know, what is the value of an improved sales process? What's the value of improved collaboration with your customers? Um, you, you know, software metrics, sometimes you have to make a lot of assumptions. Uh, a lot of manufacturers aren't comfortable with that. We're, we're used to, to looking at what's my asset intensity? How can I reduce inventory position? How can I improve, you know, margins? All, all these things, again, are sometimes tough to measure in a traditional CRM use case. When you start to pull in the outcome of our sales process into the CRM system, though, we now have the ability to actually measure our revenue realization. And I think that's critically important in, in a gap, both in the traditional CRM world as well as the ERP world. Um, we built this, we have this framework called a, a sales agreement. And I'll talk a, a little bit more in detail what that means, but fundamentally, that's the core of what we've introduced with manufacturing cloud. With that in place, we can now forecast uh, customer revenues, revenue and volumes. And you know the goal there with more enhanced forecasting is we can reduce overall costs, improve our margins, obviously, and as well as it helps stabilize um, the operations, both from a plant perspective as well as a supply perspective as these improved forecasts trickle through the uh, supply chain, the supply chain planning tools. Uh, on the opposite side of that, there's a real opportunity once you have this data inside of your CRM system to analyze customer product channel performance in the context of the customer relationship. And which again, really important. We always have that had that CRM data in the system, but now we actually have this operation visibility as well. Um, on the same same side, you know, that bridge that we saw in the prior slide of, of uh, connecting back with operations operations are now on the same dial tone as well, the same cadence with what sales is forecasting in conjunction with their distribution partners. And to kind of bring a full circle here, you know, all this information at the end of the day, we've, we've been on a multi-year journey to make this incredibly collaborative with distribution partners. The idea of sales process, you know, pricing, product catalogs, all that stuff has been native to Salesforce for some time. Now we have the opportunity to push agreements and uh, and forecast details out to your uh, your channel partners as well. So let's talk about what's been added into into core Salesforce. And I, I think there's probably a mix of of uh, people on the phone that are familiar with Salesforce and maybe some that aren't. We'll start with the the foundation. And again, Salesforce is a as a company's been around for over 20 years now. We've um, manufacturing is is one of our our foundation uh, industries for us, um, but we we were missing. We did we had great tools in place to support sales process, service processes, marketing processes, but we were missing the outcome of the sales process in some ways. Uh, once when you were going through negotiations with the customer, you were talking about volumes, you were talking about pricing. Uh, you you came to some type of agreement on that. In some cases, that was incredibly formal, like a formal long-term agreement. In other cases, it might have been informal. It might have been, um, you know, something that uh, uh, may not even make it to an ERP system at, uh, or or to uh, some type of system for action. It's just a uh, a reference point. We want to build a structure that could hold both types of um, or, or, or could hold data across the entire continuum. And this is where the idea of a sales agreement came about. It's really designed to capture the part, the volumes that are expected, the pricing associated with that, and do it in a time phase manner as well. So if I'm negotiating 12,000 units over the course of the year, maybe that's 1,000 units per month. There's a price associated with that. There might be a price ramp. There might be a price decline, depending on how I negotiated. And then ultimately, where it really comes to life is where we start connecting that to a ERP environment where we can then pull in the actuals, we can pull in some of the, the more operational details in that same time phase buckets and then see performance against that agreement. Most uh, 
this hasn't been the world of CRM. And then surprisingly, a lot of ERP systems kind of lose this visibility as well. What did I negotiate? What were my plan volumes? Um, how am I doing against that agreement? And the idea here is once we have this in place, we can start having those discussions with customers early, earlier rather than later um, about volume performance. Maybe I'm way off on an agreement that I negotiated. Let's have that discussion two months in rather than when we're renegotiating the agreement at the end. So that's really the foundation here, sales agreements. What that does drive for us though, is the ability to now actually forecast the business. And forecasting is the next major component that was added as part of the additions in manufacturing cloud. Again, this is all built on the same CRM framework and the same CRM foundation that, um, you know, that any user of Salesforce has right now. Uh, with forecasting, we wanted to take these assumptions that we had in the agreement itself and drive a forward-looking forecast from that. So back to my example of a sales agreement, a thousand units per month, I can now use that as the basis of my expectation on forecasting. Um, with a forecast engine that's accessible to the, the sales teams, they can then apply um, arithmetic, math against that. They can put uh, economics into that mix so they can take that, that baseline assumption on the agreement itself and then roll it forward into a forecast. The other piece of feedback we've had is uh, there's, it, it has been difficult in traditional CRM worlds to access this information, but there's also a real opportunity to, to roll this up and converge it with your traditional new business development process inside a, a Salesforce automation tool. And um, so not only can you have your run rate business, but you have your new opportunity-based business as well that can be pulled together here. And that, that was really the goal here behind account-based forecasting. Now, all this comes together at the distribution or for uh, partners as well. And, um, you know, since we are talking about partner communities, we thought we'd end on this piece here. The uh, With this, this new framework in place, and keep in mind, the, um, the channel partner capability in Salesforce has been in place for years. And, and Eric talked a lot about the great things that they've been doing in the, in the customer example earlier. Uh, what we've added to our collaboration capability is the, the functions and the, the uh, I guess, the foundation for extending both sales agreements and um, the forecast views into your, your uh, distribution partners. So we've taken our community framework here. Uh, communities essentially is a, is a secure framework, a secure model for accessing data inside of Salesforce, your internal Salesforce instance. And we've added uh, uh, access to the, to the sales agreement. So not only as part of your, your channel partner deployment, can you share leads and share products and product catalogs and pricing and all that stuff, you can now also collaborate on the forecast itself. And um, let's take a look at what that looks like here at a high level. Uh, this is just a, can you jump to the next slide? There you go, thank you, Eric. Um, so this is a simple view here. This stuff can be modified. It can be uh, customized and tailored, you know, for your own needs, but the, the schedules that are in place, and if you look kind of left or right on this thing, we have May, June, July, and it, it extends outwards as well. We can share things like, what was the plan quantity on my agreement? You know, we negotiated 100 on the agreement. Uh, there's a schedule on a monthly basis. Now, what are the actuals that, you, that you've consumed against that? Again, this is from a, a partner's perspective. What's the pricing that was executed as well? What's the, the discount percentage? With that in place, I can then add additional metrics. And this concept of a, a metric, we, we give you preceded metrics as you see here, but you can also add custom metrics and, and basically any type of information that you wanna share that's time phased in nature. Maybe it's like planned inventory position, maybe it's current forecast, maybe it's last month's forecast. Those can be added into the structure here and then shared with collaboration partners. So. Well, um, and then all the other frameworks that are part of core Salesforce, like uh, if you look off to the right, collaborating via this this tool called Chatter um, on, you, you know, in a direct relationship that's tied to the agreement itself, um, all that remains in place. So we think this framework really opens up a lot of opportunities for, for pushing forecasts closest to the source. I think in the current world too, with, with all the disruption due to COVID, this is, is incredibly important. 
It also makes um, your business much more responsive. You know, the quicker you get this forecast information to operations, you know, there's a there's, there's a better chance to be able to react to that or to respond. I think in some cases it makes that relationship better with your partners as well, right? They understand the role they play in, in accurately forecasting information and sharing information. So, um, so anyways, I'll kind of leave it at that, but that, I want to give you at least a bit of an insight of where we're headed with, with Manufacturing Cloud or where we're at. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit now where we want to take this framework in the, uh, in the future. So, Real quick, Tony, I want to jump. Sorry, Tony, I want to jump in here if I could. You know, I think if you look at this um, in some of the examples that I was sharing uh, with our client, and and while it's very easy to be able to see now within manufacturing cloud where we're we're enabling that ability to bring customer and 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 partner and product data together, um, I, I want to make sure that I emphasize this example here where. Um, while this is Badger, this is a, a, a partner um, in partner communities, you now get to see a couple different examples of where we're taking the Salesforce platform and all of that rich data that lives inside CRM, and but we're bringing it into a branded experience. Um, we do lots of work with, with our clients where it's not, it, we've, we've got to connect the data, we've got to create the processes, but you also have to create that experience. You have to create that branded experience because many, as you guys know, many of your, your partners are logging into multiple systems. If they're an independent dealer or distributor, they may have multiple systems they're logging into. Logging into. So we've got to make it easy and, and very simple for them. So I think this is a, a great example of not only how are we connecting that data together, but we're creating an experience that makes it easy for them uh, to be able to work in. Yeah, that, that, that's great, and I think it just really rounds out to the, um, you know, it's kind of the final elements that we're missing. This idea of a time phase framework for sharing data. So um, let's talk a little bit about where we're headed with this as well. So this we we're in our uh, actually our third release now of Manufacturing Cloud. So this was part of um, the Winter 20 release, which came out in um, the late October timeframe of last year. And uh, the, the key thing with Manufacturing Cloud 2 is it's built on core Salesforce. So at this point, it follows just the normal release cycle of, of Salesforce for existing customers that are, are familiar with that. Uh, where we're headed over the next couple of releases is to continually build out this, um, this sales agreement and forecasting framework that, that's, uh, that's top of mind and really pull it into more of a key account management motion uh, for distribution partners, for dealers, and, and for companies that, that operate in an end customer framework as well, right? There's a there's an opportunity there for tighter collaboration on some of these new elements. Um, order fulfillment visibility uh, improvements are, are planned, and then this idea of target setting as well. So being able to set targets uh, within the agreement framework and measure performance against those. Uh, again, I, I think the thing to think about with that agreement framework we've showed you some examples of um, you know planned orders actual orders but it is an open framework as well with this idea behind of custom metrics that you can add so again you want to track things like inventory position or planned inventory position or you know current forecast or prior forecast you know those things can be put in place um, account planning framework and a visit planning framework are both um, are both planned for the, the near-term releases as well um, another area of, of fairly common customization within uh, our existing customer base, this really provides a, um, an out-of-the-box framework for them to, to jumpstart uh, deployments and, uh, and, and, and give, give a more common framework, again, for, uh, for manufacturing customers. On the collaboration side itself, we're adding a number of, um, of areas where uh, we think will be compelling to the distribution community. This idea of incentives and loyalty is something that uh, some manufacturers have dabbled with. I, I think in the, the CPG world, it's it's much more prevalent, but we are seeing manufacturers ask for solutions in this space around um, incentive programs and loyalty that can be measured and monitored inside the CRM system. Uh, rebate management is planned as well for customers that um, do their, their volume, their pricing negotiation on the basis of volume attainment and then cut a rebate to their to their uh, distribution partners. 
So that's that's planned over the next couple of releases as well, based again on the framework that we saw. Uh, pricing and promotion management uh, functionality, and then uh, also a framework for dealer and dist distributor onboarding as well. So we, we're pretty excited about this. We're gonna continue to innovate, but uh, just want to give you a, a bit of a taste as to where our investment's heading over the next couple of releases. Okay, so I'm gonna, wrap up there and uh, turn it back over to Jim. That's great, Tony. Thank you so much. And just a few more questions for you both. Um, if anyone who's watching out there has a question, we'd love to hear from you too. Uh, submit your questions to us in the questions box and we'll either get to them this morning or we can follow up with you after the webinar. In the meantime, I thought we could just start with a couple questions that have been coming up as hot topics lately for the two of you as well. Um, Tony, one for you. What macro trends do you see that manufacturers will have to respond to in the next few years? I think um, well, I think there were a couple of trends that were in place for for some time now. I mean, uh, customer expectations and dealer and distributor expectations have probably never been been higher, and uh, I think most manufacturers are thinking of their digitization, digital initiatives as a way to really respond to that. Um, in some ways, I think that has accelerated with the impact of COVID. You know, obviously um, there are challenges with cash flow and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to diminish, you know, some of the challenges that manufacturers have in the near term, but I think, you, you know, a lot of the, the, the need to be flexible, innovative, um, you know, to pivot on a dime has really come to the forefront with COVID and, and digital tools really offer some opportunities there to make our businesses a lot more flexible. I think the other huge challenge is ahead of manufacturers is the, uh, you know, there's we, we have a, a large workforce dilemma ahead of us in the next couple of years. And um, I think, you know, if you look at some of the studies from the National Association of Manufacturers, um, manufacturing in the U.S. has one of the oldest workforces out there. In some regions, the, uh, you know, the median age of the of, uh, knowledge workers is in their mid-50s at this point. So, you know, what that's going to drive is, uh, you know, a bit of a mass exodus of workers retiring. And I think the challenge is where do you find people to re replace those workers? Um, you know, our universities cranking out the numbers of engineers and, and technical professionals that we need. Um, are they going to move to the locations where manufacturers are at? So all this kind of ties in with digitalization as well, right? Can we you know, build tools and technologies to act, allow us to access workers, maybe in our non-traditional environments. I think there's also a huge automation play, and especially in customer-facing activities. You know, manufacturers have done an amazing job of automating the shop floor and the back office. Um, I'd argue we still have a long ways to go in automating, you know, some of our customer interactions. So, so I think there's a huge opportunity there as well. Okay. Eric, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I think one of the speaking with a, a, a current client of ours in the last few weeks and just talking about uh, kind of COVID in general and how they're coming back from that. You know, one of the things that they shared, and I think it's interesting, is also um, this, as we think about macro trends and digitization, is how when you don't have uh, dealer coverage or distributor coverage into territories. Um, you know, big thing that manufacturers are wrestling with is well, how do we still get product uh, into those areas? Um, and I think, as we all know, the B2C world um, has really set the expectations that customers or people anywhere can get what they want delivered to them. And so I, I think another trend that we're really seeing in this, in this digit, digitization is going to be um, how do I create a way that through my, my dealer ecosystem, I can still get product into more remote territories. And I, again, I would echo what Tony's saying, I think with, with uh, COVID, it's just gonna accelerate um, that need. Awesome. Thanks guys. Um, Eric, another one for you. Uh, how are manufacturers going to change how they look at optimizing channel investments? Well, I, I joke, with you earlier, Jen, I think that's changing on a daily basis right now as they're trying to figure <laughs> out, you know, how do they get, how do they get their, uh, their dealers and distributors, you know, back to work. Um, but again, I would say the underlying 
strategy there um, has always been there and, and it's just getting accelerated again. Um, we've talked about two models now for a number of years. Uh, one we call a dealer enablement model, uh, the, the other is a dealer fulfillment model. And as you, as you looked at some of those challenges we talked about right away, um, how can manufacturers um, take advantage of, of in creating new revenue streams? In this dealer enablement model is where manufacturers are really doubling down on their, on their partner model, right? They digitize that process end to end. So from a, from a marketing standpoint, a digital marketing that is localized uh, and, and personalized with their, their dealers in mind. You know, all the way through lead distribution and quoting and configuring order management, post-purchase support, that end-to-end -end process, process is they are connecting it um, and digitizing it. And um, the whole goal here is, is how can they really um, create the, the process and the technology and the information with their, their partners, um, but it's still all flowing, if you will, through, through that dealer model. The other one that we're seeing is what we call a dealer fulfillment model. And this is really more of an omni-channel customer experience where um, you're really letting that customer buy where they want, whether that's online, whether that's in a dealership, or whether that's in, in retail or big box. But we allow for the fulfillment of the product to come through your dealer and keep them engaged, right? So inventories are still managed at the dealership. Um, they can provide the parts, they can provide the service. Um, and, and this only can happen if you have a platform where you put the customer information at the center and then you wrap um, all of the other information around it. So um, I think that investment is gonna continue. Um, it's gonna accelerate. And really it just is gonna come down to, for manufacturers as to what, you know, that have distribution, as Tony said, 60 to 70%, you know, sell to distribution. How are they going to use that? Whether they're going to create an enablement model or they're going to, or change that out to be more of an omni-channel uh, fulfillment model. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Tony, any other thoughts on your side? I think, well, I think the one other thing I would add, there's a, I think there is a pivot to, you know, this mode where, Manufacturers looked at distribution as, as a just a way to get things to market, right? There was this is how we move parts, or in some cases, it's like inventory arbitrage too. You know, the the channel partners can hold inventory and make product more accessible and quicker than maybe the manufacturer could ever think to in their own. But I, I think more and more, you know, companies are, obviously there there will always be a need to optimize and improve um, the you know the the movement of physical parts. But on the flip side of it, I think there's a pivot to looking at, geez, what investments will actually differentiate my product? And um, we're seeing that more and more too. It's not just let's, let's improve efficiencies in, in distribution, communications and collaboration, but um, also what, what investments are really gonna change how my end customers view, view the products that they acquire. And um, I, I think that trend's gonna continue. Thanks, Tony. Uh, one more for you. Um, how does this pandemic influence how manufacturers will prioritize digital initiative di digital initiatives going forward? I th well, I think in some ways it's it's certainly accelerating discussions. I think it's also I, I was meeting with a couple customers last week and they both are are challenged in that they've had to furlough, they've had to lay off workers. Uh, but on the flip side of it, they have a huge concern that, uh, you know, are they going to get everyone back? And part of it relates to, you know, they, they were individuals that are approaching retirement age. Um, they're just kind of done. So I think for them, you know, this, you know, finding ways to automate those processes is going to be incredibly important. Um, you know, we're obviously in a, in a tight situation probably throughout the balance of the year, just economically. So a lot of these things are gonna to have to be prioritized and provide no value. Um, but, you know, given some of the additions that we put in place inside our CRM framework around forecast, around, you know, tighter collaboration with channel partners, there, there is a real business 
um, value there, right? That can be achieved. And I, but I, I think in the short term, you know, it's going to have to be hard value realized. Um, but it's going to be on these the, the basis of look. Uh, I also have to, I have to respond to this this market that's in front of me here with in terms of people and, um, you know, gaps in skills, the need to really automate things. Eric, any other comments from you on that one? No, I think you know Tony. Tony covered it. I, I think what we're as we're talking with our clients, there's initiatives that are moving forward. They know they've got to they got to move fast, but um, you know, with budgets are where they are, um, there's a hard look at, at what value that's going to deliver. And and as we look at things like automations and and ways that you know to make sure that that knowledge and information is retained. Um, and, and doesn't go out the door. Um, I think that there's a lot happening right now that we're seeing um, with, with our, our customers that are, um, whether it's on the service side or on the sales side, um, making sure that, that the information is getting captured and used and now starting to look at automation to be able to, um, to take care of things. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, we do have an audience question here. Thanks, David. Uh, has Salesforce thought about or implemented contract management functionality, including digital signature applications, into your channel partner portal? There's um, we've kind of um, relied on partner solutions in that space. Uh, a big part of what we were after with manufacturing cloud was making sure we captured the elements for um, you know detailed tracking of performance. Um, you know, so we for, for signatures, for you know, clause libraries, all the stuff that's involved in actually creating the contract itself. We, we still have a, a network of channel partners that we we look towards. Uh, some of them have already built specific functionality as well into manufacturing cloud. So if, um, if we need to have a follow up on that, you know, feel free to reach out to me or uh, your account team, and we can certainly cover that with you. Thanks, Tony. And I know we're getting close to the hour here too. So um, before we wrap up, just FYI, we'll be sending out the recorded version of this webinar to all of you for your convenience. So feel free to share it. And it will also be posted soon on our website to watch on demand. Uh, otherwise, if you'd like to learn more about anything featured here today, you can download the full Forrester uh, manufacturing study for free that Eric mentioned earlier. That's available at proficient.com. Uh, you can also contact us directly and visit the insights area of our website to see related blogs on manufacturing and partner management. If you'd like to learn more about manufacturing cloud, there are a ton of just great resources on Salesforce's website as well, including an overview, video, demo, and some terrific at-a-glance sheets. So again, we'll be sharing the links to all of you um, so you can take a look and learn more after the call. And on that note, we'll go ahead and wrap up, but I just, I wanna say a sincere thank you to both of our speakers, Tony and Eric. I could listen to you both all day. So I'm so glad you could be here today and it's been a pleasure as always. And thank you to all of you who joined us this morning as well for your time, your questions and your attention. Again, we'll share the recording with all of you soon and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks everybody.